Okay. So good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. I'm Kushbu Saha. I'm an international medical graduate from India, from Lady Harding Medical College, New Delhi. So today, the topic of my presentation is the clinical approach to pediatric seizure. Now, I'm not going to compl complicate things because everybody knows what seizures are, what epilepsy syndromes are. So not going into the theory of it, but the clinical and the practical approach towards it. As a first year resident, what's important for you? So that is why uh, that is how we're going to proceed in the further presentation to see how we can diagnose seizure in a more algorithmic manner and how can we can go about in its management. Okay. So why the urgency? Why is it that we need to diagnose seizures more urgently when it comes to a pediatric population? Because first of all, they're one of the most common neurological emergency in a neonatal period occurring in up to one per to five per 1,000 live births, making it into uh, making it as a huge uh, condition and a huge emergency that we need to tackle with. And the entire idea behind treating seizures in an urgent manner is to prevent the, uh, the status epilepticus, which in itself is going to cost a lot in its own management. It's going to cost around $10,000 to $100,000, in even in case of refractory cases. We need to make sure that the mortality and the morbidity needs to be cut down when it comes to status epilepticus. So the faster, the, the faster we intervene, the sooner can we save the child from having neurological sequelae because of the seizure episodes. Now, as a first year resident in a, or a, as a general practitioner, most of the times you are able to diagnose seizures using the three pillars of diagnosis, which is the history, the examination, and the imaging at most. We, most of the times it's said that 90% of the times you're able to diagnose and reach to a conclusion and initiate timely management and only in very few cases would you require the intervention of a child neurologist. And even in refractory cases, only in two to three percent cases is when you require the uh, intervention of an epileptologist who would manage refractory cases and complex cases associated with various developmental disorders and other associations. So our focus would be how to approach as a first year resident. So the first step in seizure management, I'm going to discuss the five steps of seizure uh, to uh, approach towards the seizure and how to manage it. The first step is how to differentiate it if it's a true seizure or if it's a true pseudo seizure. Because the entire idea rests upon the fact that if you want, if you give the diagnosis of a seizure in a child, the child is labeled with a seizure disorder throughout their lives. And the next time they seek medical intervention, they would not be investigated to an extent to rule out if it's actually a true seizure or not. So a huge importance rests upon the diagnosis if when we're making it for the first time, whether it's a true seizure or it's a pseudo seizure. So first of all, we have to decide, and these are the this is the table showing uh, the differentials of a pseudo seizure when it's not a true seizure, and what are the other conditions which it could be instead of a seizure. And we should spend some time understanding these conditions. So this is our video. As you can see in a video, uh, in a pseudo seizure, there are various signs that uh, uh, but the telltale sign that you could rest upon is if when you focus on the eyes. When you focus on the eyes, you can see that the eyes are closed, which is almost invariably associated with a true uh, with a pseudo seizure. In a true seizure, your eyes might be uh, in a blinking fashion. They, the patient might be staring. There might be an up case or an, uh, or just a one sided case. So the eyes are one of the most important signs towards telling you whether it's a pseudo seizure or it's a true seizure. As you can see in the other video. The child is convulsing. There are tonic uh, posturing that's there, but the side, eyes are closed and the child is holding onto the cot. Now we come on to the second case. Here you can see, this is a case where the child exhibits a startled response, which is basically, uh, it's basically tonic posturing of the body upon any sort of visual or auditory stimuli. And it's known as hereditary hyperreflexia. It's an exaggerated startle reflex and it's associated with frequent muscle spasms along with tonic posturing. And the initial and the entire trigger is either a strong light, a noise, or even their own crying can lead to such muscle spasms. And you have to understand and understand the history. If you ask the history in such a uh, case, you would come to know that the patient, the uh, parents of this patients have also experienced the same thing because it's a hereditary uh, disorder and it, uh, and it, uh, and the hereditary fashion is associated with the autosomal recessive condition. And the treatment lies on by benzodiazepines and antispasmodics. And the patient can do well on very low dose of clonazepam throughout their life and can be stable on it. 
coming on to this video where you could see um, okay so in this video you can see that the child is resting comfortably on the bed it's a home video that the parent have bought, the parents have brought and you can see symmetric twitching and clonic jerks of both the limbs and the patient's sleep is undisturbed and this is known as benign neonatal sleep myoclonus it's an entirely benign condition uh, the etiology underlying uh, this condition is the transient imbalance in serotonin uh, levels and hence the treatment to this is either reassurance because it's a benign condition, it resolves uh, itself resolves by the age of two to six months of age. There is no uh, requirement of any EEG. Video EEG might be required to differentiate it from other disorders. The, the most common differential being the benign familial neonatal myoclonus syndrome, whereby the patient exhibits other signs of developmental disorder as well. In this case, there is uh, the patient can exhibit such signs of myoclonus uh, upon sound or touch or even uh, even the touch of a mother. But when you wake up the child from the sleep, the child will be normal and absolutely healthy. So this is also a form of pseudo seizure known as benign neonatal sleep myoclonus. Coming on to next one. Okay, so in this video, you can see a characteristic uh, video of a child crying undergoing a tonic posturing and then turning sino there's sinuses of the lips and then now the child turns limp and does, uh, doses off so it's if anybody can guess this is a classic picture of breath holding spells so breath holding spells the sinotic type are a very common uh, type of pseudo seizures which presents as seizures and can be mistakenly diagnosed as seizures in this case it's frequently associated with anemia and iron deficiency and supplementing the patient with three to six, uh, iron with iron for three to six months can resolve this condition. It's also associated, uh, there's another uh, form of it, which is known as the reflex anoxic syncope or reflex anoxic seizures, which are the pallid type. If you understand that the chai, uh, in case of reflex anoxic syncope, the patient might uh, uh, be running and playing and then suddenly they turn pallid and they fall on the ground and there is no tonic posturing. There might be some, some amount of tonic posturing, but it's classically just a breath holding spell, which needs to be uh, treated with iron supplementation. So in this next video, if you observe the child, we are giving, them, uh, we're giving the child a glass of water to hold. And suddenly with, the, with this activity, the child's arm will go into a dystonic posture. So the, this falls under the category of paroxysmal dyskinesia. It's basically a pattern of dystonic and coriform movements, which are absolutely painless. So now it's classified uh, into three types. And I'm going to show this video again. There is another video whereby you can see these are two siblings, whereby these, uh, when, when one of the boy walks, he's normal. But in the right video, you see, as they continue to walk, the leg goes into a dystonic posture. Now, this is also a type of paroxysmal dyskinesia, which is uh, classically known as paroxysmal exercise-induced dyskinesia. So now what are these entities? If you go back, so these are just, as I said, as I mentioned, painless, dystonic, and coriform movements that happens in a child. This is, these are absolutely benign. There are four types which are classified according to the trigger. The paroxysmal kinesogenic dyskinesia, which was the first video which you saw, whereby the child, the, when the baby was given a glass to hold, the hand went into a dystonic posturing. So the trigger in this case are sudden movements. The other ones are paroxysmal non-kinesogenic dyskinesia, the trigger to which are alcohol and caffeine, and these are most frequently seen in adults. The other one is the paroxysmal exercise-induced dyskinesia, the one that you saw on the right, the video whereby the child was walking, and after walking a few steps, the leg went into a dystonic posturing, and this classically responds to thiamine. Uh, and the fourth one is paroxysmal hypnogenic dyskinesia, which occurs classically during sleep, and it's very rarely seen. So the focus is on the point A and C, which occurs very frequently in children and might mimic a seizure. So it's important to diagnose and understand these disorders so that we can in, in, intervene at the same time. And, you, and if you see the intervention is pretty different. In case of exercise-induced dyskinesia, the treatment uh, is thymine, and the patient responds beautifully to thymine. So, um, I'm going to move ahead. This is another video. And if you can see, it's classic upward, upward gaze. And when the patient sticks out the tongue, so this is a typical case of oculogyric crisis, which is uh, 
side effect of antipsychotics and dopamine antagonists like metoclopramide. So the treatment in this case is diphenhydramine and benzodiazepines, and you do not require anticonvulsant agents. This is a case whereby the baby is, uh, there is underlying torticollis, there is nodding of the head. And if you see carefully in the eyes, there is right beating nystagmus in one of the eyes. So if you can guess, this is a classic case of opsoclonus myoclonus. And this is basically, this one is spasmodic mutants. And you need to differentiate it from opsoclonus myoclonus syndrome. If in case there's bizarre uh, nystagmus in one of the eyes, then you need to get an imaging done to rule out an underlying optic glioma. Moving ahead. So these were for a few examples of pseudo seizures and how you can differentiate it from a seizure because the management is entirely different and you need not require anticonvulsants in the treatment of such episodes. So the second step, which is important and which is a very important step in diagnosis of seizure in pediatric patients is the history. So most often the patients have uh, a provoking factor that might underlie the cause of seizure. Most importantly, it's the fever, any sort of CNS infection like meningitis, encephalitis or encephalitis, head injury in case of uh, you need to rule out abuse in that, children, in that child, any underlying tumors, especially if it's associated with bizarre nystagmus of the eye, there's head moving and there's jerking of the head, hypoglycemia, one of the very common and frequently missed causes of seizures, especially in the neonatal period. Electrolyte imbalance, most importantly, hypocalcemia. You also need to rule out toxins and patients might un have an underlying history of carbon monoxide poisoning and they might present with seizures, especially in pediatric population. And then drugs, you need to rule out the use of antihistamines, especially for allergic cases and bronchodilators in asthmatic patients, which might also present as a syncopal episodes because of underlying QT prolongation. Now coming on to the other category, which is the unprovoked category, whereby the underlying uh, reason is a birth trauma, a birth asphyxia, there might be associated developmental delay or regression, and there is a positive family history of because of underlying epilepsy syndrome that is running in the family. So that is a separately, entirely separate uh, diagnosis, which, which will be based and which will be worked upon by further child neurologists and epileptologists. But as a first year resident, it's important to understand the uh, broad classification of history and how to understand and how to go about the diagnosis of seizure according to that. The third step is understanding the seizure seismology and the characterization. So it becomes important from the point of neurosurgical point of view when we need to uh, anatomically locate where the seizure originates from so as to intervene surgically. But for us, what it becomes important is to understand various forms of seizures which are typical and uh, they have a very typical presentation. For example, if you have a nocturnal presentation, the child frequently gets up at night they, they drool, they stare at uh, for a few moments, there might be few chronic jerks, they might lie down again. This is a classic presentation of a benign childhood, childhood epilepsy syndrome with centrotemporal spikes on EEG and also known as Rolandic epilepsy syndrome. The child might also get up at night with bipedal automatism, there might be automatism in both the limbs and they behave bizarrely, they might be crying, shouting and this is a classic feature of nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy. And the other one that we frequently are tested upon also is the morning seizure where the where classically happens in a juvenile case or adolescent, they get up in the morning and they have myoclonic jerks, which is a telltale sign of juvenile myoclonic epilepsy and they respond beautifully to valproate. So why it is important to understand the characterization is because depending on the focal and the generalized sense of seizure, the focal seizures in children respond beautifully to carbamazepine and oxcarbamazepine, whereas the more generalized seizures would respond well to drugs like levetiracetam and phen phenytoin and sodium valproate if the child is above the age of six, uh, two years. So if you can see, if you see this video classically, it's a classic presentation of absent seizure. There is uh, 10 to 20 seconds of absolute staring and then they can return to consciousness. So this is a classic absent seizure that happens very commonly in children and might be misdiagnosed as inattention, laziness. The child might have to undergo repeated uh, school absentisms. And there is a lot of uh, stigma that is associated with this because you don't really understand most of the times as to what is happening. And it's labeled as just mere laziness on part of the child. So it's important to understand the presentation of such cases in children. 
So in this video, you can see there are sudden shock-like contractions that usually appear at irregular intervals in an isolated muscle, or it can be in a group of muscles, which can lead to movement of the limbs altogether. And they might be present in the resting state, or may, they might be activated by a stimuli, which might be emotional, visual, or auditory, or even a touch. And this is, in this case, this, was a, this is a classic feature in case of SSPE, which is a complication of measles. So especially in case of children where infectious disorders are, uh, they take an important role in causing seizures. SSPE being a complication of measles, we need to understand how it presents and how to intervene in that case. So if you closely observe in this video, the child has extensive spasms of the upper limb and the lower limb and which are unprovoked. So these are very classic. Uh, it might not be very classic when the child is lying down, but if you pick up the child in, in the lap, you might see the extensor post posturing and a jackknife posturing whereby the arm and the legs, they go into an extensor spasm. And that is classically, if associated with developmental delay and hips arrhythmia, it is called one of a uh, very favorite uh, question as well, the West syndrome. And the treatment options in this case are ACTH, Vigabetrin, and even oral prednisolone, but clinically used options are the ACTH and the Vigabetrin. So if you notice in this case, the child is comfortably watching a television and suddenly starts laughing or crying. So they have just unprovoked episodes of laughing. And if the baby is able to communicate, you'll understand that the baby will say that I cannot control this episode of laughter. It might be confused with ADHD, with other behavioral disorders in child, but it's a, actually a kind of seizure known as gelastic seizures. These are very hard to diagnose and, and imaging is required to rule out the underlying cause of gelastic seizures, which is most commonly a hypothalamic hematoma. So now we've seen the different types of seizure presentation in children. So you could see how to differentiate from pseudo seizures to seizures, what to ask on history and, and the third step in diagnosis of seizure is the examination, which is very important from inspection and from, uh, and from other aspects. So if you inspect, you can see the adenoma sebation, the ash leaf macules, the shark green patches, and the baby has infantile spasms. And if you trace the history in mothers, the mother also has adenoma sebation, which was priorly known as, uh, which was called so because it was confused with acne. But if you, un uh, if you, uh, subject the patient to a treatment of acne, it doesn't resolve. So these are basically hematomas of various organs, and it classically presents in tuberous sclerosis. And it might also present the periungal fibroma. So this might be an underlying epilepsy syndrome that might be causing the seizure in the child. If you can see in here, there are this classic dysmorphic, it's not a very classic dysmorphic feces, but just dysmorphic feces. And if you can see, there's a protruding uh, four, fifth, uh, sixth digit so it is, uh, it's classic for hypoparathyroidism retardation syndrome, also known as the partial D-Jordson. The patient has dysmorphic features. There are uh, polydactyly. On examination, if you, uh, if you subject them to blood tests, they will have hypocalcemia. Uh, and on imaging, they have classic bilateral basal ganglia calcification, which I'll, see in, which I'll show in other slides, in further slides. And these patients present with intractable seizures. And for them, they need to have a neurosurgical evaluation done to correct these forms of seizure syndrome. This one, you can see uh, you can see a portmine stain on the left side of the body, on the left side of the face of this child. And on the imaging, you can see choroid plexus enhancement on the MRI. So it's a classic for Stooge Weber syndrome, which presents with portmine stain, leptomeningeal capillary enhancement, seizures, intellectual disability, and glaucoma. So these patients, they require continuous monitoring and neurosurgical evaluation, as well as treatment of glaucoma and rehabilitation for their intellectual disability. So now the fifth and the last step is the labs. Once you've come, uh, once you've uh, crossed all the pillars of diagnosis from detecting, from uh, making a diagnosis between pseudo seizures to seizures, the history, the examination, and then conducting the labs, the so most importantly, when you've stabilized the patient and you've, uh, uh, you've underwent the initial stabilization with airway and, and breathing management, and you've uh, secured an IV line, you need to get the blood glucose, electrolytes, and calcium checked. Because as we discussed, hypoglycemia is one of the very common causes of seizures in neonatal and infantile period. 
in a febrile child, if the patient presents with a uh, fever, do a CBC or CRP and a lumbar puncture based on the clinical discretion. May, most of the times, lumbar puncture might not be required. But if the patient presents with high fever, there are signs of neck rigidity and there are men, signs of meningismus, then go ahead with the lumbar puncture. A toxicology screening will also be very important if there's history of the child being uh, there in a closed car or in a closed house. So when to do imaging is the case because you need to balance between exposing the child to radiations toward and conducting an imaging to reach to a diagnosis. So CT is usually required in emergent conditions, although its specificity in detecting a lesion is less compared to MRI being only 7 to 8%. It's required in conditions where the patient comes with head trauma and it's also used to detect calcifications, especially the basal ganglia calcifications in case of hyperparathyroidism retardation syndrome, which are missed often missed on MRI. The MRI are considered for children with refractory cases or those who have classic temporal lobe epilepsy findings and have equivocal C CT findings as well. MRI can also be used as one of the uh, investigations to detect the underlying developmental delay and why, as to why the patient, if the patient presents with developmental delay and seizures, which might not be evident on CT. So as you can see here, if you can see on the first image, the ventricles are enlarged and there is calcification, periventricular calcification, which is classic for uh, uh, torch infections in child. In the second image, you can see basal ganglia calcification, which as we discussed is present with uh, hypoparathyroidism retardation syndrome. In the third one, it's a subdural hematoma. So the baby uh, would have undergone some accident or subjected to abuse. In the fourth, uh, and this is as well a subdural hematoma, but a chronic one. In the fourth image, you can see leptomeningeal vascular formations. And the fifth one is also one of the resolved cases of such vascular form malformations. So now coming on to the role of EEG. So what's the role of EEG in case of kids? Because as uh, in case of kids, the, it becomes even more important to get to the root diagnosis because they are not able to provide us with a pertinent history compared to adults. In an acute setting, EEG is required to uh, diagnose it and to rule out non-epileptic uh, seizure episodes. And in that case, if the patient is not responding to multiple doses of uh, anticonvulsants and the, still the patient is unconscious, you need to rule out as to if there's an underlying uh, seizure episodes that, ha that is happening in the child or it's just the side effect of benzodiazepine or excessive benzodiazepine. In case of a stable child, the EEG yields highest results within the first day of the seizure episode. So now the yield is increased if the baby is sleep deprived, if there's uh, if there's some sort of activation, there's some sort of startle response underlying the seizure cause, there's prolong and there's prolongation in the presentation, or if you do a repeat EEG to monitor the response of the child. And it is the only investigation that is recommended for all children for, with the first non-febrile seizure episode. So if the patient presents with uh, non-febrile seizure episodes, we have to go uh, and do an EEG to rule out uh, seizure disorders. And it's also predicted of recurrence. The recurrence is if the, if the EEG is abnormal, the recurrence goes as high as 54% compared to 25% if the EEG is normal. So in this EEG, you can see this is a classic three hertz generalized spike in wave pattern. You can note the normal wave activity prior to this generalized spike in wave pattern. And this is classic for absence seizures. So you can see in this picture, it's a normal EEG pattern. But in case of uh, the second image, you can see there is slow spike in wave compared to the other one, which was very rapid three hertz pattern. This was a very slow spike in wave pattern. This associated with developmental regression is a classic sign of, uh, is a classic in case of lennox gaster syndrome, which is one of the cases that we saw in our clinic as well. The third picture you can see here is the normal EEG compared to this four to six very uh, fast spike in wave pattern with poly spike wave discharges. And it's a very bizarre pattern that you can see. And it's classic for myoclonic seizures occurring in juvenile epilepsy syndrome, classically presenting in the morning and in adolescence. If you see in this image, it's as if the uh, the entire seizure uh, recording has gone, gone berserk. And this is a very bizarre wave pattern known as hypsarrhythmia, which is classic for West syndrome. And a baby presenting with infantile spasms, developmental delay, and hypsarrhythmia on the EEG picture the diagnosis being Vespa syndrome. In this case, you can see that there is focal slowing of waves in between. And this could be because of an underlying space occupying lesion, which could be an underlying tumor. And in children, especially from developing uh, countries, it most commonly becomes neurocysticercosis, which could lead to seizure episodes and a classic slowing of waves. So 
Now coming on to the management. So once you've uh, gone through the monumental task of diagnosing a seizure, characterizing a seizure as to if it's a pseudo seizure or a pseudo seizure, we have to uh, we have to urgently intervene on the, in the child. So the initial step is stabilization. As with any emergency, any any neurological emergency, you need to stabilize the child with airway and breathing. And once you've obtained the IV access, you need to check the blood sugar levels, their uh, blood electrolyte levels, and uh, you have to diagnose. You have to distinguish based on the history and the examination if it's a pseudo seizure or if it's a seizure. If it's a pseudo seizure, you just have to reassure the patients, uh, parents, and you have to monitor the child for any further seizure episodes. And if in case the patient has a history of aura. If there is any post ictal period, there is history of seizures in the family, and there is any sort of provoking factor that is present, go ahead with seizure management, which in this case, you can see if the, pa if the baby has fever, you have to suspect uh, encephalitis or meningoencephalitis. If the baby has uh, abnormal sensorium, you have to go forward with antibiotic administration. Take a, take a sample of lumbar puncture before you administer the antibiotics, but quickly administer the antibiotics to prevent any sort of neurological sequelae. The second being, if the baby has normal sensorium, patient presents with high fever and a seizure, it's more likely to be a febrile seizure whereby you need to manage only with antibiotics. You also need to rule out any trauma, toxins, drugs, any previous CNS insult in the, in the form of head trauma, which might have led to the seizure and need to appropriately manage that. In case of unprovoked seizure, you need to diagnose and determine the etiology using a neuroimaging and EEG, whereby, and you have to also uh, refer the child for a child neurologist specialist to undermine, uh, to de determine the need uh, for long-term AED profile access. So this is just to sum it up, the management, treat the provoking factors, hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, and hyponatremia, and use abortive drugs, which being lorazepam and midazolam. So in case of hospital management, the drugs preferred in case of kids are lorazepam and midazolam in this doses as mentioned, 0 0.1 milligram per kg uh, in kids. At home, if the baby is a diagnosed case of seizure, the parents are usually given with a midazolam spray or a rectal diazepam, which can be given. And what to do in case of febrile seizure? In case of a simple febrile seizure, no imaging or EEG is required. You can diagnose, diagnose it based on history and examination. The CSF can be done in case the baby presents below the age of one year and there are other features and the baby is ill, not feeding well, in such cases, CSF can be done to rule out underlying signs of infection. In case of a complex febrile seizure, we need to rule, uh, rule, the cause, rule out the cause using an EEG and a CSF analysis. So what leads to a re uh, recurrence in case of febrile seizures? The factors being young age, positive family history, low degree of fever causing seizure, or seizure at the fever onset, compared to fever lasting for several days and then a seizure happening. So in these cases, the recurrence uh, goes as high as 20 to 70%. Now, why is it important? Because you need to make the parents aware of it and you need to counsel the parents in such cases because the recurrences are common up to the age of five years after which it uh, undergoes self-resolution. Then the risk of future epilepsy is six to 7% in such cases. Now, the question arises when to treat them. When do you initiate a profile access, uh, being it intermittent or daily profile access? Now the question, uh, now uh, based on how concerned the parents are, if there's any underlying uh, developmental delay, if there, if there are any underlying signs which are pointing towards epilepsy syndrome, then a profile access can be started. Intermittent profile access can be given using benzodiazepines and daily profile access can be started with phenotyne and levetiracetam and valproate of the babies above the age of two years. So that finishes the presentation. Now some fun trivia time. If you can identify this uh, image, it's a very famous image of Van Gogh. So this happened, uh, Van Gogh, if, uh, as we all know, was a diagnosed case of epilepsy. So it's, um, it's kind of uh, speculated that he was controlled, his epilepsy was controlled by the Dutch doctors on digitalis, which made him to see bright colors. And thus you can conclude why the sunflowers and the classic Van Gogh paintings. If you see, so seizure has a long history of being considered to be uh, a demon entering the body or the patient going berserk and it's just a psychological disorder so we've come away we've come a long way from diagnosing it based on spiritual energy to be it being a clinical entity so this is also a very famous painting which is in florence which is depicting a woman in seizure and how they're treating and the bishop and, and the uh, father is treating her because they suspect that there was a demon entering her body so thank you so much for for your attention and oh. thank you